Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you for having us. I'm excited for this discussion, Skinner. <laughs> um, I guess it's apropos, because uh, we sit on a board together, and that's how we first <laughs> got to know each other, is by being on the board of directors of TripAdvisor together. Absolutely. Um, so before we jump into the board list and talk about diversity on boards and why it's so important, uh, I want to step back a little bit and start with um, your background and some of your career. Uh, you spent five years at Google running mm -hmm. uh, Asia and Latin America. Mm -hmm. You also spent time at Amazon. These are two incredible companies, obviously. So what was the most impactful experience, or what was your biggest takeaway from your times at, at Google and Amazon? You know, I learned, as you would expect, very different things. So when I was at Amazon, it was 1998 to 1999. The company was 500 people going to 1,200 uh, in the corporate offices outside of the warehouses. Um, and I would say, and my job was, just so everybody has the context, I came via an acquisition, and I was the first person to work on bringing third-party merchants to the Amazon platform. So the acquisition was the precursor to Amazon Marketplace. And so at Amazon, it's actually really interesting. What I learned, and this is so obvious, but it's so true, um, to, to build anything truly impactful takes much longer than you think. I mean, we look at Prime and Marketplace today as inevitable things, right? right? And they're not a surprise to us. But when you think about the fact that we were bought by Jeff when the company was 1,200 people, and the resistance inside of Amazon to the idea of having third-party merchants on the site, just as Amazon was building out its own categories, like toys and home and garden, there was a lot of resistance internally. But even back then, Jeff had the vision for Marketplace. And it took three or four different tries before Marketplace succeeded. So at Amazon, the learning was really, you know, as much time as you think it's going to take to build something great, double it or triple it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but that founder vision was there from the beginning. At Google, I learned something very different. And it probably is applicable to the board list in many ways. I mean, first of all, I learned portfolio theory. I learned how to manage multiple businesses that were scaling. Um, and I had some of the worst markets in the world for us. I had China, Japan, and Korea. In Korea, we had 4% market share. And I had some amazing businesses, Australia, Brazil, India, where Google was as um, prevalent in, uh, in the number one search position. And so I learned portfolio theory and how to sort of trade off your winners and losers and laggards and, um, and all of that. But more than that, I learned how to evangelize and negotiate for myself. And so if I look back at that Internally period. Internally with your with my, I, team I, and in, On multiple dimensions. Okay. So um, I'll give you two examples. So I learned to evangelize and negotiate for my team because even though international at Google is a big business, I represented less than 10% of the business. And I was competing for resources. And you can imagine, I mean, from the debate to enter China and all of the debate around censorship to competing with Sheryl Sandberg, who was managing online and you know, lobbying for her resources, and Tim Armstrong, who was managing North America. And they already had dominant businesses. So I had to evangelize for myself at the highest levels for my team. And then I had to actually evangelize for myself. I had my, second, uh, my first child when I was at Google, and I went into Eric Schmidt and Omid Kordistani, who ran the business overall. And I said, I am pregnant. I really want to keep running international. And I need you to pay for my daughter and my nanny to travel with me around the world business class. And Google said yes. Now, does that, did, did that come naturally to you, that ability and willingness to advocate for yourself? Or was that something that was hard and you had to sort of muster the, the courage to uh, um, lean People in, will I tell guess, you I've always <laughs> been a pretty aggressive person. I okay. mean, I always say I thought I was leaned in until I met Sheryl Sandberg. And then I realized there's a whole other level of lean in. So I have to say I've always been a pretty aggressive person. You know, but that ask was the first time in my career I took uh, being in a position of power and negotiating power and really needed to make that work, right? And then I had to turn around and negotiate at home with a husband who, quite frankly, I was married a year, did not want me traveling around the world with my child and nanny in tow and leaving him behind. And I learned how to negotiate with him multiple times over, including for my third child. Um, so, so I would just say in that period, I learned to advocate for myself professionally, for my teams, for myself, and to really put myself out there um, at a whole different level. So, while I would say I've always been aggressive, that was still a level of risk for me that I hadn't taken before. So, okay, um, gosh, there's a lot to a lot to think about there. How do you um, <laughs> negotiate with your husbands, ladies, uh, <laughs> and I, vice versa? I, to the I, men. Um, uh, I, I, we could we could that would be interesting to discuss, <laughs> but I don't know your husband. I don't want to I don't want to get on his bad side. Um, no, what what I want to understand is sort of what advice you give um, to women who are earlier in their career, because of course at that point you were already running yep. a huge division of Google. Yeah. Um, so so how do you what advice do you give to a woman earlier in her career? Like what does it really mean to advocate for yourself? 
Yeah, you know, so I think two things, and, and this is probably not gender biased advice because I'd give it to anyone who's early in their career. Mm -hmm. um, look, I mean, for the first 10 years of my career, I was just heads down and I just worked my, ex my ass off and I did what I call excellent work for excellent people. So that gets you a pretty long way, it turns out, right? Both those things, make, make sure you're working for somebody who you think you can learn amazing amounts from and I was always privileged to be able to do that. And number two, just do whatever it takes. I mean, if everybody else is here, you have to be here. I think once you achieve that, particularly in tech, and we can talk about biases on the other end, and I'm sure we will. But once you achieve that level of credibility, tech is a place that actually treats its superstars, you know, well. Like it's a very kind of individualistic place. So the reality is once you have credibility, your ability to negotiate for yourself increases exponentially. So that's not to say, gosh, gee, it's just good enough to work really hard and, um, uh, and that's all it takes. I think for women in particular, I think advocating yourself to, for yourself doesn't always come that easy. I right. think there are many women who are so busy caring for everyone else that the idea that they would say what they need first is maybe not as intrinsic. And there's data, I, I think, yes, on, on this. this, right? Yes, that, absolutely. That, that says, for example, that women only uh, typically apply for internal jobs where they meet almost all of the criteria, exactly. but men tend to apply when they only meet half of the criteria or whatever, that, right? That's, that's absolutely right. That men tend to think they're qualified for things that they may not necessarily be qualified for, and women aren't sure they're qualified for things that they're like overqualified for. I mean, and there is data around this. So, I mean, I think the only thing I would say to women is, A, you know, if you think you don't need to negotiate in your professional and your personal life to make it work, you're wrong, you do. So you do have to sort of bolster yourself and say, what do I need to make this work? And there is a negotiation at home and there's a negotiation at work. And how do you get to the point to negotiate credibly? It's like how you get there anyway. You have leverage because you are a superstar, because you are great at what you do. And then you don't go in with arrogance. I never went in with arrogance and said, gosh, gee, I'm so awesome. Google, you need to do this for me. I went in with confidence that I was great at my job and enough humility to know that if they actually gave it to me, wow, like how lucky was I, right? And I think that's the balance I always seek in, uh, in people who sort of, I love, they lean forward, yet they know that they're not entitled. So you, you took this um, professional philosophy that allowed you to succeed at Google, and you, you focused a lot of the last couple of years of your career on trying to create a new initiative which helps scale this across mm -hmm. other companies. And right. um, describe what the board list is, why you created it, and, and what you hope it to accomplish. Got it. Um, and by the way, my career sounds really rosy, so at some point I'd love to give you all a story, um, my own personal story, of, uh, and, I'll, and I'll share in a moment about why I started the board list. But um, how many of you are familiar with the board list? I'd like to see a few people in the room. Okay, so not that many. Um, uh, we're only about two years old, and the board list is a peer-to-peer -peer platform where CEOs and senior executives with experience on boards, people like Spencer, um, and founders in the room who sit on your own board, you're equally qualified, nominate uh, diverse talent, in this case women, for board service, from, uh, from Series A all the way to public company boards. And then companies can come in and search for great board talent. So it's a talent marketplace specifically for boards, early stage all the way to public. Um, and I started it for two reasons. On the one hand, as you can probably tell, I'm an optimist. I'm somebody who believes in possibility. And I feel like genuinely I had a pretty meritocratic career in the Valley. However, when I became an entrepreneur after Google and uh, started a company called Joyous, which was in the fashion space, I had no trouble raising money. I had no trouble raising money because I had been at Yodely as a founder, which was a fintech startup, and it had a public company exit and then got bought. I'd been at Google with engineers early on. Um, I'd been at Amazon. So I raised money pretty easily. But as I was back in the startup ecosystem in my 40s, not in my 20s, I would hear these appalling stories right. from younger women entrepreneurs. And I was like, really? Did that really happen to you? I think the worst thing I heard recently, I forget where I read it, probably GeekWire, was uh, a, a, a startup founded by women who invented a fake male co-founder yes. as part of the, the pitch. To, I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. are you kidding me? Are you kidding That's me? And so I mean, sad. They're, it, they're so sad. And, they're so, and there are multiple stories of women who walked in with their male co-founder with the assumption that the male co-founder is the CEO, or should be, by the way, even right. if she was. So I would hear all these stories, um, and I'm an angel investor uh, behind a number of entrepreneurs, men and women, including uh, people like Katrina Lake at Stitch Fix, who's become an amazing entrepreneur. Um, and it's built a, a, a really valuable business, as you all know. 
But as I heard the stories of women younger than me who didn't have um, maybe the 15 or 20 years I had in tech and, and the Rolodex I had by the time I ra raised money, I really came to believe that my experience in the Valley was not the entirety of people's experience. Um, and so I, I was thinking about starting something. And then one thing kind of compelled me to start the board list besides hearing these women's experiences. And I remembered that my very first experience in the Valley was a pretty terrible one. So I was five years into my career. I'd been at, in investment banking on Wall Street. Uh, I'd been in London working for News Corp for the CEO and COO. And I'd had a pretty high-flying career for my first five years. I was like very you know, successful in these male-dominated industries. And I came to the Valley because I really wanted to be an entrepreneur and I didn't know how. And I started at a company. And on day two, my male boss told me that I was scaring the secretaries. On day two, I'm like, what could I have possibly done in the first 24 hours, to excuse my language, scare the shit out of the secretaries? I mean, really, I, I didn't even know. I was like, did I go to the bathroom too aggressively? Like, what was it? <laughs> um, and meanwhile, I saw a male uh, employee who'd been hired by my male boss, who was multiple times older than me, and incredibly emotionally volatile. And he kept get, get, getting given a hall pass for his volatility and his kind of ranting and raving and sort of, you know, well, that's just that person. And increasingly, I got menial tasks, and this person was rewarded in the workplace. And I remember there was a conversation. What year, what year are we talking? I'm, we're talking like 1997, okay. 1997, I think. And I'm 27 years old, and I, like I said, I've arrived in the Valley with success. And so I basically um, say to my boss in the parking lot, I'm like, I don't understand what's going on here. And he's like, geez, Sukinda, you're like the rookie on the football team that we just need to coach. And I'm like, it's funny, like I've had five years of work experience and nobody's ever told me that before. In fact, they just give me, keep giving me more and more responsibility. Like, what do I need coaching for? I don't even understand. And so six months later, I quit. And I quit pretty uh, dejected and pretty sure that I was not destined for the Valley, pretty sure that I was not destined to be a biz dev executive. And I almost left, and luckily for me, I interviewed at a company called Jungly, where the five male Indian co-founders loved me and I loved them. And I joined, and six months later, we were bought by Amazon, and my career took off. But in remembering that experience, I was like, wow, this actually almost happened to me, too. I've forgotten about it, because everything in between has been so good. And so that's what compelled me to start. So has that much changed? Um, well, I would say the last 12 months, that, you know, yes. has been an acceleration of change. It's I mean, amazing, right? It's I mean, amazing. The, uh, you know, so what do you think it's changed in the last 12 months? What's well, changed a number of very brave people stood up and used the power of technology and blogging and social media to shine a bright light on this appalling situation. I mean, in 1997, when that happened to you, you had no right. means to spread the word. And even if I had, I didn't have the courage to. Okay. And so you're hitting that. So I think, are things changing? They're changing, I think, because with the intersection of three things. And they're not all negative, right? But there is some, uh, there's some neg negative stuff in there that we have to acknowledge. Number one, we are seeing more and more women founders building valuable companies, whether it's Julia Hartz, whether it's Katrina Lake, whether it's the women at Birchbox, whether it's Jennifer at Rent the Runway. I mean, across all sectors, we are seeing women B2B, B2C building companies. And people say, well, the percentages aren't high enough, Sue Kinder. And I'm like, you know, Spencer, compared to when I started my first company in 1997, there are a ton more women out there. And so as women have successful outcomes, this is sort of trend one, and we're starting to see, you know, I suspect we're going to see the first unicorn here go public. I hope when Stitch Fix goes public, led by a woman. That will be a milestone for us, mm -hmm. and I think it's important. Number two, we do see people using technology to make change, right? In multiple areas. I mean, the board list is an example. There are many other people who are sort of saying, look, we're going to use technology for good and for impact. And then number three, to your point, there has been loss. There has been bravery, and there has been, you know, power loss, financial loss. For the first time, there have been repercussions to being a bad actor right. in this ecosystem. So, I mean, it's, it's obviously uh, awful how, much bad, how many bad things have to happen and how much sort of negativity has to happen for something good to result Transpire. from it. You have been watching the last couple of days of the Harvey Weinstein um, you know, train wreck unfold, yeah. and woman after woman is coming out with a very similar story about yeah. how they felt uh, disempowered, they had no choice, they had no ability to speak out, and then um, now they're finding their voice right. years later because of strength in numbers, really. Yeah. So I think we can all agree that the things that we're reading about those types of allegations and you know, in tech or outside tech 
are awful and inexcusable. Let's, let's talk about the business impact, though, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. When, when you see mm-hmm. slides like, um, you know, slides like this, which mm-hmm. uh, talk about what impact diversity, gender, and other types of diversity have on business results, mm-hmm. I guess articulate the business case for diversity. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, for for all of us. So, and I'm not going to actually articulate the public company case for diversity, which has been well made, and you can look at the numbers yourself and read McKinsey's studies or Catalyst. I'm going to articulate the private company need for diversity. So how many of you in the room are founders? A few of you. How many of you are in companies that are early stage? number of you, I hope. Um, the, the reality is the number of early stage company boards that are not, not dominated by financial investors are very few. And in the early stages of the company, what do you most need? Advice, help, you know, perspective. Because here you are building a company from the inside out. You don't understand your customer. You don't understand your B2B or B2C customer. You don't understand maybe your employee base that you need to build. And so diverse thought in that boardroom is more important than ever. In, in those cases, it, takes the, uh, the, it looks like operators in the room. It looks like another CEO. It looks like somebody who represents your customers. It looks like somebody who represents your employees. It's diverse, right? But most private companies don't take advantage of that independent board seat, and as a result, you have a board that's dominated by financial folks. That's all well and good, but at the end of the day, think about the opportunity to be great at what you do simply by renting the talent you could not afford to buy. I would say to people, if you're a founder and you don't think about an independent board seat, I'm like, why don't you go rent that brilliant superstar mind, who, by the way, is likely not coming to your startup when it's 10 people, but may well sit on your board and give you the perspective that you're lacking, you know, whether it's in terms, or the skill set you're lacking, whether it's in terms of how to create demand for your product, or how to solve a supply chain problem, or how to think about deep technology application to your, uh, to your product and vision. So diversity drives better outcomes. D- diversity drives better thinking, better outcomes, better execution, I suspect, and I think is uh, white space with, with regard to private companies, actually. Okay. Um, but uh, what do you say to someone who says, uh, I mean, this is, the, this is the question that universities have been asking themselves for decades of, yes. as they've tried to create more diversity. Uh, you know, we don't want to lower the bar, quote unquote, yeah. <laughs> uh, by seeking a diverse ta- candidate for this role, whether it's a director position or some other position. Well, you know, I, the irony I find about people using the phrase lower the bar is I think Silicon Valley is built for people who've been given opportunity that they're not qualified for on paper. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I have never in my life had a job for which I'm qualified on paper. Yeah. Not yeah. once. When Me I too. became a founder and an SVP of biz dev at the age of 29, I certainly wasn't qualified. Were, I mean, no, were you? No, I, I was totally unqualified were you qualified for every, to be CEO every job I've had in tech. Have. <laughs> This is my point. So we will take a bet on people all day long and take a high potential candidate and move them into a role of you know, increasing responsibility or to become a CEO or to take in funding when they are not remotely qualified because we seek opportunity and great talent. Yet somehow when we talk about women, this turns from sort of taking you know, all the available pool of talent and taking advantage to, of it to a kind of a lower the bar conversation, which I think is ridiculous because we live in a talent economy where all of us are starving for talent. So let's take the long view because um, the last two years, this has been, um, you know, this has really consumed mm-hmm. the tech industry from, uh, you know, from the Uber discussions to now, I guess, Harvey Weinstein, to, like you name it, right? It's been all we can talk about the last yes. couple of years. 10 years from now, when my 12-year-old daughter and I guess 20 years from now when my six-year-old daughter are in tech, will we still be talking about these issues or will it be as silly as talking about left-handed people versus right-handed people? I mean, we would never be discussing how to include more left-handed people in in these types of roles. Over what time frame will Will this problem solve solve itself or will it never solve itself? Well, first of all, I think it will solve it. I, I think it will solve because I think we're seeing a generation of millennials running companies whose value systems and whose upbringing has been diverse. They have had mothers who not just work, mothers who are in extreme you know, positions of power. They will have had sisters and you know, brothers and transgender friends. I mean, people of all different stripes who have succeeded and who are part of their ecosystem and they don't have a second thought about it. I mean, I'm sure as many of you, my, my children think, think nothing of the fact that we had an African-American president. I right. mean, 
as it's just not notable. It's, of course, why wouldn't we, right? Where 20 years ago, that would not be the case. So I think we're dealing with kind of a, clearly a generational shift and people who have grown up with a different set of role models. Um, so I think that's, well, that's one case. Number two, of course, I mean, as we look at the women continuing to have outcomes, that will change the paradigm. And number three, and this is not to be overlooked for your daughter or mine, who's 11 years old, or you know, the sons and daughters of many of the people in the room, I think we need to remember that we all look at like, girls in STEM as the singular solve for the next generation of problems, right? Or the next generation of opportunity. And I just want to point out that it's not just that we need, you know, new role models, which is happening, and women having outcomes, which is happening. I think we need to train our children, particularly our girls, not to think of just them, but to think about becoming makers. And so I think it's as important to train our children on design thinking and entrepreneurship as it is to train them in STEM. So I understand, like, look, if my daughter wants to do a science degree, great. But mostly, I want her to understand that like entrepreneurship is not some far out thing, that it's as easy as like setting a, a website up when she's seven years old and writing a book when she's 11, you know, and who knows where it goes from there. So I think that's the, the third part of this, right? All right, well, hopefully 10 years from now, our girls will, our daughters will co-found a company together <laughs> and you and I can, can back them together and be on the board and uh, they'll come and present at the GeekWire Summit in uh, 2027. Thank you for the discussion, Sikinder. No Thanks problem. Very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, John.